Welcome to Greenhouse today. If you're joining for one of the first times ever, or maybe the first time ever, I'm Mike Patz. I'm one of the pastors. This is two of our other pastors. Pastor Joel, introduce yourself. Hey, I'm Pastor Joel, associate and, pastor here. And Pastor John. And my name is John Lash. I'm the pastor of Greenhouse Church in South Florida. What's up, SoFlo? Love you guys. And we're about to really take some sober topics right now and kind of go at it. We're going to talk about what's going on culturally. We're going to try to do this from a Jesus perspective, but we're going to look at uh, the racial realities that are taking place, injustices in our culture, how are disciples to look at this, and what does unity have to do with any of this in times like right now? So I'm not going to do anything else to, other than let you know at the conclusion of this interview, I'm going to come up and just bring the word, okay? I'm going to bring a word that's going to, uh, I think, address some of this, but I'm going to go ahead and start with some questions, and I'm going to start with you, Joel. Uh, you know, what's, what's going on with these protests? What's going on around the country right now? Why are people so angry uh, why are people rioting? Why are they looting? And, and again, what I have is we've got a black pastor, in case you haven't been able to tell. He is black. He is white. All right. Hello. And, and I want us to be able to approach both of these and just kind of what's going on right now. Yeah. Um, so I would say I, I just got to keep it, keep it 100 with you all and just keep it real. Um, you know, the past few weeks has been extremely hard. I, feel, I felt a myriad of emotions from sadness to anger to just full throttle rage. Um, you know, two weeks ago, we've had the killing of Ahmaud Arbery, a young, unarmed black man who, about the same age as me, going for a jog. And, and I, I watch you jog down yeah, the street all the time. you watch me jog, yeah. So just seeing, you know, two white men come, pursue him, kill him at, at just point blank range, and his body's left in the streets. You know, they go home, wash up, eat dinner, and I just remember feeling just the sense of devastation, the sense of anger, of rage. And, and I've been following Christ for a little while. I've never felt that type of anger and pain. Um, and so when you see these riots and these protests, people are like, man, what's up with all the anger? When we look at Ahmad, when I look at Ahmad, when people within our community look at Ahmad, we see ourselves. So fast forward two weeks, two weeks, and now you have George Floyd who's killed and Man, I can't tell you, I, I couldn't watch the full video of, of, of that, that account, but there was a part of me that was like, man, this is not real. This has to be a movie. Like someone's gonna come and say, cut, this is not true. And seeing George Floyd, I seen my father, I seen my brother, I seen my friends. And so when you see the, the anger and the riots and the protesting, it's a result of people looking at unarmed black men who look like us, murdered in cold blood in the streets. And there's just a part where when I see them, I see some of the, the best men that I know, the best men that the world has to offer. I think of Latif, and I think of Sola, and I think of my brother who are amazing fathers, amazing husbands, and the sheer thought that someone looking at them can take away their life simply because of the color of their skin, it, it deeply disturbs me. And so I think all of the protests, the anger, the frustration is coming out of a place of, no, we must have justice, and we demand it. And so I think that's, that's a, a big part of the response that you're seeing. So, Joel, is it hard for you? Because I'm sure Pete, you've talked to people that have said, hey, I don't think it had anything to do with the color of his skin. I just think it was something else. How, how are you answering those people that are saying that? You know, it, for people who would say, hey, this is an incident. This is a single incident. It has nothing to do with the color of their skin. I would say you have to come into the story knowing the full context, right? And so when you look at the context of our nation, you see not just one incident, you see that from the beginning, from the very beginning of our nation, it was created, not, it was created in such a way for people of color, minorities specifically, for them not to thrive. And so when you have in 1619, you have the first black slaves that were brought to Jamestown, Virginia, you have the whole system of slavery of 400 years going all the way back to 1865 with the Emancipation Proclamation. What you have is not, not a system, not something that's broken. You have something that was created this way from the very start. And so when you look at that in the greater context, you don't just see a single incident. You see, man, like our people, people who are minorities have experienced this for a very, very long time now. So some people, 
are wanting perhaps to be able to have the luxury of, of taking this starting right now and they're looking at one piece and what you're saying is there's an entire story. You gotta, you gotta look at this chapter in light of an entire story. Absolutely, absolutely. So John, talk to me for a second about with you. I mean, this is a little bit of a different journey for you and that's one of the sure. reasons we wanted to have two of our pastors that are here, I think coming from different you know, vantage points, but sure. uh, this has been a long journey for you. You're a white Jewish male growing up in South Florida, I mean, yeah. give, give me your, I mean, where are you coming from right now? Yeah, so this is, um, as you mentioned, I think context is helpful. Um, so I am white, there it is, and, uh, and I'm also from a Jewish background. I grew up in South Florida in a fairly uniquely diverse context as South Florida tends to be. Um, I went to an elementary and a middle school that was 90 plus percent non-white, so that was African American, that was black and Hispanic. And so all of my first friends growing up, I was one of the few white guys in the room all the time. I went to a high school where I was, it was almost exclusively white, and I was the lone uh, white Jewish kid there. And then I went to, when I came here, um, at that point it was First Assembly, now it's Greenhouse. Um, I was involved in a campus ministry that was, that was once again very diverse, where I was often one of the few um, white guys in the room. And so, so I, th I think my experiences trend in me in, in a direction, I, I would often be in a room and there would be a comment, oh my gosh, I can't believe white people. And then it'd be like, oh, John, you're here. I'm like, oh, hey, hey here I am. And, and it was like, and, and there was real relationships there, but I, I, had a, I had an opportunity to sit as a fly on a wall and hear lots of stories and have lots of experiences. And so for me, when I hear things like this, I, I resonate with what Joel's saying. I'm like, it, you're not dealing with some isolated incident. I've heard the stories from friends that I love firsthand. So for me, it's been a journey of like, what do I say about it? And how do I say things in a way where I'm not making it worse, where I'm helping and not hurting, where I'm, where I'm leaning in and, and being empathetic? And so um, that's been the struggle for me. I think if you're, you know, if I could speak to, to my white brothers and sisters for a second, I think a lot of you might be in that same spot and you're like, I see it, I, I feel it. You're like, I've got friends in my micro church, I've got people in my church family. I, I just don't know what to say where I'm not gonna make it worse and I'm not gonna offend and I'm not gonna, and so uh, this is the beauty, by the way, of the family of God, which is every tribe, tongue, nation, and language. Um, and so I had a conversation with my friend Ryan, one of my best friends ever since college, um, a black man who sings like an angel. And, uh, and so we were sitting down and, and so I just kind of shared my heart with him. We, you know, we were already very close. I said, and Ryan, here's what I'm thinking. Here are all my thoughts. I, 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 I see it to some degree. I know I haven't experienced it in the same way, but I, I love you. I want to do something, but I feel like if I say the wrong thing, I don't want to make it worse. I don't want to hurt. And I'll never forget what he said to me. And he said, you know, God, I've been crying so much, man. He said, John, I understand. And if you, if you say the wrong thing, it might be hurtful. He said, but I need you to know that if you don't say anything, it's equally and sometimes even more hurtful. And so ever since that moment, it's like, man, Jesus, I'm, it's not an option for me to say nothing. And, and so here's my, I guess here's my, if we're talking fluency, greenhouse, we have these fluencies. I, I feel like I'm at baby speak. Like, I feel like I'm at, my daughter, Lucia, is 11 months old. She says, goo goo gaga. Here's my goo goo gaga attempt at speaking justice and doing it in love. I, I think for me, as, as a white individual who has had a varied experience in America, the more conversations I have with, I'm just talking like our church family who are people of color. I, I think for me, it has to start, where I go by default is my head and it has to start in my heart. And so maybe I'll give an analogy because I think when it comes to race, it's, a, it's an uncomfortable conversation for, so many, for everybody, I think, to some degree. Yeah. So let me just talk about my son. I have a son named Liam. What's up, son? Love you. He thinks it's cool that his dad's on TV. Love you, son. He's almost four. When we first had our son, he was about a year old, and my wife and I were first-time parents. You know how it is as first-time parents. Every, every moment with your kids, you think the sky's falling. They cut their knee. You think they might die, you know, and, and you're in that emotional state. And he got this new gift. It was this little tricycle, and I was with him, and we were doing it. And I looked away for, I kid you not, it, like a second. Somehow, the thing flips. He falls, splits his lip, and he's gushing blood and he's sitting there bleeding and I, I'm there not thinking you know not knowing what's happening with my son thinking my son's gonna die I mean I'm just all in these deep emotions on top of the fact that I feel like the worst parent ever and I'm sitting here in this space and so what did I do I reached out to my community I texted our microchurch I was like guys and I'm just freaking out guess what my microchurch did 
They said, John, well, you know, factually right now, the percentage of children who die from a busted lip, I, I would have slapped them in the face. What they did is the only appropriate thing you do with friends who are deeply hurting and, and, and wounding and feeling this on a visceral level. What they did is say, John, we love you and we're praying for you because that's the only appropriate response. And so I think if I could talk in, in a spirit of love and empathy and trust me, this is my goo goo guy. I'm, I'm trying here and I'm sure I'll blow it. If I could talk to, my, to our faith family, our church family, if you don't follow Jesus, we're thrilled you're listening into this conversation. You might just be like, nah, y'all are crazy. But if you follow Jesus, here's his path. He always felt it before he fixed it. And if I could talk to our, our, our church family right now who are white, who are not people of color, I would say it, it, facts are good and, and data's fine and, and we don't have, but you don't start with your head, you start with the heart. And to be able to lean in with a place of empathy and, and, and endeavor to feel, which is by the way, exactly what Jesus did with us. The word became flesh and did what? He sat with us, he felt with us. I think that's gotta be the starting point. And if we can start there, if we can get ourselves there, that's just where I'm trying to go right now, and I think something really powerful can happen. John, that's really, really good. That's really good. Okay, give me one word answer to a couple questions, John, and then I'm going to come to Joel. This is challenging John, for preachers. John, is there a problem in our culture with injustice, with oppression, with racial bias? Is there that problem? Because, God, I mean, I write a blog, and I've had much pushback saying there is no problem. But is there a problem? 100%. That's my one word answer. Joel, is there a problem? Is oppression there? Is that there? And can you clarify, what, what do we mean when we're talking about systemic ra oppression, for example? What do we mean when we're talking about, what is systemic racism? Yeah, I would agree with John. You know, when we talk about systemic oppression, um, immediately people will hear that and their, defense, their f defenses will go up. You know, it's become a byword for, hey, that's liberal propaganda and um, that's, that's kind of the left-wing agenda. But again, you gotta take it in its full context, right? So when we look at the history of our country, we see that from the very beginning, it was, it was built in a specific way. And so systemic oppression or, or systemic racism is to be woke, it's to be aware of the oppressions that minorities face within this country. And so, I'm sorry, guys. You're good, man. Yeah, can you, can you ask me the question again? I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, just when we're, I mean, oppression and injustice and systems and structures it's not just a theory, like it's a, yeah. it's a real thing. And I, and, and I think there's this stumbling block, you know, like, and I, and I love where you started, John, which was, you know, if, if you're just up in the head, you know, someone's like, well, prove this to me kind of thing, you know, but I'm, I'm asking you as, as a man, as a brother, as a Christian, as a black man, as a pastor, as a disciple, Joel, what, tell us the truth. Is, is yeah. that there and describe this for us? Yeah, so I would go with what John says. So we can go into the numbers uh, and look at, you know, 1619, but I think every single black person, every single minority in this country has two experiences at one point. And it's typically early on at a very young age. For me, it was probably around 12 or 13, where the two experiences, the day that you find out that you're black and the day that you find out that's a problem. And for me growing up, I lived kind of like, you had the hood on this side. I lived like right on the railroad tracks where, you know, you had Liberty City, Little Haiti on that side, and then you have Miami Shores, kind of the wealthier neighborhoods on that, on the other end. And I would go to school, my school was right there in the inner city, and my friends and I would walk home from school, and I lived like down the street from our school. And so I remember walking from practice and having racial slurs yelled at us. I remember walking home for practice because we kind of, our school was in the inner city and where I stayed was like right there on the, on the outskirts. And so I remember walking and police officers stopping us, harassing us. I remember watching my dear friend who I love get tased for no reason but walking home or trying to get home. And so when I think of these realities, systemic oppression, to answer your question, it's this interconnected 
blackness within our society where people that are minority, people that are black and brown are oppressed by a system economically, educationally, uh, financially, within every area of society, we're facing oppression. Um, and it goes back to the very foundation of our nation, which was started in such a way where it wasn't meant for us to thrive. We were taken from Africa, brought over to the States to build economy, for, free economy, pretty much. And so when you think about it from that vantage point, if you were brought and if you were taken from a slave in Africa, brought over to the United States to build free labor and free economy, then you were never brought over here in mind to actually partake and have a seat at the table. You were brought to serve and to make sure that things were comfortable, but you were never brought to actually sit and have a seat at the table. And, and I think, Joel, if we're, if we're drilling even a little bit deeper into this idea, um, it's not just, we're not talking 400 years ago. So let me talk about my experience here in Gainesville, Florida, the land of God's favorite sports team, the, the Florida Gators. Um, I just had I'm crying the whole time. I tried to lighten that a little bit. Um, I worked before for about 10 years. I was on staff here in Gainesville. And one of my, one of my roles was I was the local missions pastor. And so did a lot within the local community, a lot of things here in Gainesville, a lot of things in East Gainesville. I was a teacher at Eastside High School, um, and we worked in a lot of Section 8 housing communities. Um, we would do community development, grassroots community development, work with local leaders, learn from local leaders, do different things. And so that felt strangely familiar to me because that was my, most of my life upbringing. I was regularly, you know, accustomed to my all the way through up until high school. I was regularly one of the few white guys in a setting. So I was like, oh, this is, this is great, you know. And so... I had a common recurring theme that would happen over and over again as I was in these communities, especially dealing with any grandmas, uh, black grandmas or grandmas of color. They would say, you know, and it took a long time off, and I did this role for a few years. They said, you know, you're the only white friend that I've ever had. And so the first time I was like, cool. The second time I was like, okay. And by like the 10th time, I finally was like, what do you mean? They're like, well, I, you know, I, I grew up here in Gainesville during segregation. I grew up and I remember when that middle school was blacks only and I remember this water fountain and I realized, so we talk Gainesville, Florida. I appreciate like 400 years ago. Let me talk the 70s. Gainesville did not desegregate until the 70s. You're not talking about, I have to dig way back in the Rolodex of my memories. You're talking about in the lived life experiences of people that are in their 60s. To, to, to imagine that that's just going to magically go away, I'm like, come on, guys. If we want to talk head, I talk heart. You want to talk head? Come on. Be, be, more, be more realistic. And so that's, that's just like on a factual level. But I think, Joel, hearing you, hearing you share your heart, I'm like, listen, church. This is, like, Joel, you're my brother. This is our family. I'm like, how much? That's a tip. What I shared, the game, desegregation, all of that, it's in recent memory. That's the tip of the iceberg. But it really shouldn't take any more than, wait a second. You're my family, and by the way, the normative conversation I've had as, as a white person but a follower of Jesus who loves our church family deeply is anytime I have a conversation with a, a member of our church family, a friend of color, and I'm like, hey, what, you know, person of color, hey, what's going on? They have over numerous heartbreaking stories like you just shared. Here's all it should take. Wait, you're my family, and you're telling me this is real? Then it's real. Like, I, you don't go to your family and you're like, well, you need to prove it to me. Come on. It's like, they're your family. And so for me, that's, that's really all it takes. I'm like, church, can we just acknowledge God sets the solitary, which was all of us, in a family. And as a family, we feel with one another, and we sit in that space, and then we go and we do justice, and we love mercy, and we walk humbly. Yeah, and I think that's the, the most hurtful thing. If, I'm, if I can be honest, just having, having someone dismiss your pain right, expressing the reality of like, man, these are things that I face. These are things that I witness my brother face. These are things that I witness athletes that I get a chance to pour into on a regular basis. I witness them face these discrimination and these disparities every single day of their lives. And to have that dismissed by people who are supposed to stand in solidarity with you, I mean, I think that is the most disturbing thing. Um, talking to a handful of people this past week, they're like, man, Joel, like, I get it. The world is going to, they're going to do their thing. But having the church 
where we're expressing hurt and pain. Like I knew I could not sleep for days. Like at one point, just, just hearing of George Floyd, like I got home in front of my wife and just wept. Like I've never, she's like, Joel, I know you to be a joyful man. I've never seen you so low. And the reality is to have that dismissed by people that we worship together and go on missions, mission trips together and serve together, um, I think that is the most, the part that stings the most. Yeah, it feels like a betrayal at the deepest level. Yeah. You know, in church, I, I really need you to hear my heart in this, you know, as the senior pastor of our church, that where, where we say we want to go follow Jesus and he says, he says to weep with those who weep. I mean, just, I mean, just even right there, that the only way I can weep with someone that's weeping is I am going to put my heart in their heart and my, my feet in their shoes. And, and there is a serious problem on, I mean, like there is an epidemic of, of a lack of taking Jesus seriously right now with this. And, and I mean, I feel very personally repentant about this, uh, even on behalf of the whole church. But let's talk about diversity and unity just for a second here, because we got a massive challenge on our hands. I mean, I'm, I, I'll just let you guys know this is not a pity party. I'm saying I've got an inbox full of letters from black people that are piecing out and white people that are piecing out, yeah. and everyone's running to their own side of the cafeteria, as, as the book says. Guys, talk to me about diversity. Um, I mean, so many of us are here at Greenhouse because we say we love diversity, and yet when it comes to the hard times like right now, like this is where I think the rubber meets the road. I think what a lot of people like is they like to be in a room with lots of colors. I don't know that they want to be in a room with lots of hearts. So, so this is the interesting thing. Um, show of hands. If you're here at Greenhouse and one of the things you tell your friends is, I love how diverse my church is. Raise your hand. I'm sorry. Just do it wherever you're at right now. Okay. This is diversity. <laughs> this is it. Like diversity at the deepest level means that everybody brings something that's a layer of comfort where they're like, oh, that's my thing, that's my song, that's my jam, that's my perspective. I feel so considered. And everybody has something that's very uncomfortable that they have to wrestle with out of love for someone else that that is their thing. And so I think in this moment, I, I'll give you a great example of this. I have had multiple conversations at this point um, with friends, with white friends, who, who basically said, man, I, I, you know, we, were, we started talking about George Floyd. We've talked about it in a lot of our microchurches here in South Florida, and I'm sure Gainesville, Orlando, and beyond. And, and they said, man, I, I just couldn't watch the video. It was too heavy. Which, by the way, is part of the definition of, of privilege is that you can choose to not feel those emotions. What you heard from Joel is I, Joel did not have a choice because his lived experience has been different than mine. Joel felt those emotions whether he wanted to or not. He said, I, 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 mean, I just can't watch the video because I, I, I just don't want to feel those emotions. And I think the reality is leaning in and pressing into those things is the nature of diversity. It's, Jesus's prayer was, Lord, that they would be one. How? How deep does that unity within diversity go? As I and the Father are one. And, and so I think the reality is in this moment and in this space, this is what diversity is about. It's not like, oh man, I liked it when the church was diverse, but now it's like, no, 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 no. This is, this is it. Like you're living it right now and it's uncomfortable and it's painful and it's gut-wrenching. But if you press in, the promise from Jesus is that through the refining fire, you come out better. And I think for all of us, that's what's at stake. It's like, I, I told Pastor Mike, and I knew it. I'm like, I'm going to cry. I know it. I've been crying more in the past two or three weeks than I have the past two or three months because I asked God, Lord, I, I don't get it. I haven't lived the same experience, but I want to feel it. So, Lord, help me feel it. And he has been answering that prayer. And that's my prayer. If you're watching this right now and you love Jesus, just stop for a second. I get it. You're like, man, I, I'm, maybe you're strongly political. Maybe you've already started fighting the voices of politicizing in your head. Just, think, just stop for a moment as a follower of Jesus. Let me ask you a question. Do you want to feel what God your father feels for all his kids? Then ask him. And then when you get that heart, move out of that place because that's diversity. Yeah, I would add to that. I think one of the important things when it comes to the path and the journey, and I just really appreciate, John, you expressing your heart. And can I just share, man, the solidarity of brothers like John, and there are so many that I can name, Scott Brown, who's completely different than me. Here you have a guy 
born and raised in Ocala. Here you got Joel, born and raised in Miami. And I tell you what, God has knitted my heart together with Scott Brown in such powerful ways. And, you know, Scott was there with us this past Saturday, marching with us. And, and so when, when I think about diversity, I think about two people being willing to walk the uncomfortable path. Most likely, if you're, gonna, if you're gonna walk in diversity, you're gonna be offended, hmm. and you're gonna be offensive, hmm. but you're gonna choose to press on anyway. And I can't help but think my wife leads a Bible study with a group of other, other wives, and you know, our times in our country is crazy. It's crazy right now, and so she just said, hey, how are you guys processing the recent events? And here you have a group of women, white, black, all different backgrounds, and they start just sharing and expressing, and, and one lady is, she's sharing and expressing, and it's getting heated, emotions are there, it's, it's messy, and one of the ladies are like, hey, I'm leaving the Zoom call. And my wife just responded and said, if you leave right now, that would be one of the worst things that you can do. Mm. And she shared that, and she was saying, hey, if you leave right now, it feels uncomfortable, it feels messy, but in that, it's gonna, you're, gonna, you're gonna grow so much. You're gonna learn so much. You're gonna be what God has created you to be if you stick it through. And right now within our nation, there's this feeling within our churches and in different circles where man, I, I don't wanna be around white people. And I, I don't wanna, and, and listen, I get it. The pain, the, the struggle, the, the anger that you feel, but for us to go back into our different areas in the cafeteria, would only be for us to fail to be what God has called us to be. Mm. Revelation 7 says, man, there's a day that's coming where every tribe, every nation, every tongue will be gathered together to worship the Lamb. And that is the goal. That is God's dream. That is God's heart for us as the church. And it's my prayer, man. I have made up my mind that at all costs I would choose to forgive. Earlier this week, I was filled with anger. I had my inner Tupac wanting to roar, roar its ugly head, but I had made up my mind at all costs I would choose forgiveness. And so I think when it comes to diversity, you have to make that commitment that I'm gonna walk together and, and there's gonna be people who, they're not gonna get it immediately. But here's the thing, walking in diversity and loving others doesn't demand that they change the moment that you want them to change. It's to say, hey, you know what? I'm gonna walk together with you and we're gonna to walk towards Christ and together he's gonna to change the both of us. Yeah. And we have to make that commitment on the front end. Guys, that's really awesome. I, I think you guys, I think you've really hit some, some massive things. Any closing thought you guys have on either the application for a speci specifically a white person or a black person as a disciple of Jesus yeah. that hasn't been covered already. So I'll hit the application if, if you're a white person watching, a follower of Jesus especially. Um, twofold, really the, the principle would be listen and learn. I think this is a great moment. As I said before, um, the, the what, what you say matters, how you say it matters. I think when you say it matters immensely. I think this is the moment to, to feel, to ask God for his heart, to see things how he sees them, to feel them, how he feels them, to listen and learn. Um, I think in, in regard to that, I think you want to look at resources. So there's, there's tons of great resources out there. Um, we, we shot a video and sent it out to our South Florida church family, but um, books like Generous Justice, Just Mercy, um, there's documentaries you can look at, 13th, there's things like the new Jim Crow, so different resources. The other thing is you do want to press into relationships, and so I, I want to say this very specifically because I think it's important. If you have existing friendships, like legitimate friendships with people of color, press into those right now. Lean into those relationships. Have phone calls, text back and forth. How are you doing? Pray with one another, encourage one another, share life experiences. That is very great right now. If you have surface level acquaintanceships with people of color, do not pretend that they're deep friends. I think the tendency, and I'm speaking as a white person, the tendency right now is to feel all the feelings. And so you have, we actually have to learn how to embrace some feelings and reject other feelings. Here's one of the feelings, shame. You reject shame. That's not from Jesus, by the way. Godly sorrow produces repentance, which means change and transformation. Shame actually turns you inward and you get selfish because you're so focused on yourself. You're not actually thinking even about other people. You're just thinking about yourself. If you currently do not have deep friendships with, with brothers and sisters in your church, or maybe you're not a Jesus follower with other people of color, 
sit for a moment and ask yourself why. Like feel that for a second. Again, not some shame-based way, but genuine self-reflection. And maybe that, needs, that, that probably needs to change in your life. That's probably something that needs to happen, but, but you might need to wait a little while for that. Like it, it is, I think it can be very offensive for you to try to step in and pretend that a depth of relationship was there prior to this. And, and if we're being honest, sometimes it's to assuage guilt, it's to make us feel better, it's to, it's to validate, well, I'm not this, I'm not that. Sit there for a moment. Maybe your starting point is, go ahead, grab the resources and start there. Let your learning happen there. Because you're going to have a, the reality is you will have a lifetime to build a diversity of deep friendships and relationships in your life, which I think we're hopefully all realizing we need to give us the varied perspective and diversity that God has and desires for us from his kingdom. But, but I think that's important. And I hope you hear my heart on that um, because I think it's important. Yeah. And I would, I would add to that, you know, just talking to various people this week, you know, a lot of people are grieving deeply and rightly so. I mean, we saw an unarmed man get executed on national TV. Um, but at the same time, we got to find a way to grieve deeply, but also trust God deeply. Hmm. And I think there's a balance in that. And so I'm not saying, hey, um, you know, everyone has their different timetable um, in terms of you grieving and you processing. But I really want to encourage you that at some point, there has to be a resurgence of hope and this belief that rises up in you that I know my Redeemer lives and I know that he's going to stand upon the earth, that I know in the end the gospel is the power of God onto salvation to everyone that believes. And so for me, just processing this week and, and, and meditating and thinking and reflecting on the state of our nation and what has transpired up to this point, I, I found myself deeply saddened, but then the gospel points me to this reality where I believe it can change. I believe the power to transform. And I love Sean King and I love all of the movements that's taking place for justice and for the cause of justice. But I believe it is the gospel ultimately that's going to transform the human heart. And so as you're grieving deeply, I need you to turn your gaze at some point and look to Jesus and believe that what he has said. I mean, we have here we have this amazing God who comes down into our world through 42 generations of different people from different walks of life. Some were kings and some were peasants, but they're all in his lineage. And he comes into the bigotry and the racism and the hatred of our world in order to bring us to relationship to himself and to bring us into relationship with one another. And I think that is the gospel. That is the power. That is the tool we have in our times right now, in our arsenal. And so I encourage you, man, like at some point, I'm not trying to tell you how to grieve and I'm not saying all blacks are monolith. Like we all have different opinions and thoughts on how to approach things, but we come from, we, we have a Christian worldview and that's what girds us, that's what grounds us. And at some point you gotta get to the cross, you gotta get to the gospel. Man, that's so good. Church, I'm going to give you about a one-minute stretch break, and I'm so thankful for Pastor Joel, and I'm so thankful for Pastor John today. I know there's some of you like, okay, give me the word. We're going to close out today's service with just a short word from the Bible that's going to tether these things and bring them together, but I pray that the grace of our Lord Jesus is going to be upon you, upon all of us, and that we will be the lights of the world in this time, in Jesus' name. Amen. See you in a minute. Welcome back, Greenhouse. I'm Mike Patz. I am one of the pastors around here coming back from multiple weeks of recovering from the surgery. So good to be with you. Challenging circumstances, overwhelmingly sober moment right now. But I invite you to look at a scripture from Jesus with me right now. Matthew chapter 23, verse 23. I want to talk about the weightier matters of the law coming out of Matthew 23, 23. If you're ready right there in the chat, you could just say, let's do this. Say, amen. Say, go Jesus. Here we go. Matthew 23, 23 says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! Exclamation point. For you tithe mint and dill and cumin, but you've neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. Let's pray. God, help. In Jesus' name, amen. Hypocrites. Everywhere I go, I talk to people and I say, why don't you go to church? And they say, I don't want to go to churches because churches are so full of 
hypocrites. They say one thing, they do another, they act one way, they should be acting some other way, but they end up bringing hypocrisy. And this is exactly where Jesus goes when he speaks to the Pharisees. And he brings these harsh words where he says, you have enforced some parts of God's word, but you've neglected other parts of God's word. And I call that hypocrisy. It was the dilemma of the Pharisees who were right about many things, but they were wrong about weightier things. And Jesus calls them the weightier matters of the law. And he describes them as justice, mercy, and faithfulness. And right now in our culture, I just want to close out our time today with a call to mercy and to justice and to faithfulness. Let's start with justice. Jesus says that you are to to embrace and to attend to justice. What is justice? Justice is that which is right in the eyes of the judge. In the Old Testament, justice was almost always coupled with righteousness. Righteousness is that which is right. It's that which is not wrong. It's, it's when something is correct, when something lines up with truth. It's when things on the earth square with the things that are in heaven. So righteousness is that which is morally acceptable and true and right and accurate. Justice is the application of the righteousness in the real world. Justice is the application of that which is right in systems and structures, in society and culture, in the world, in the job, in the house, in the place, in the cities that we live in. That is what justice is. And that is what we're dealing with with what happened several weeks ago with, with George Floyd. And I've had so much, there's been so much drama, there, and, I, and I realize there's a powder keg, and man, I am begging you, if you follow Jesus, to hang with me for a minute right now, man, I'm begging you, because right now our culture needs the church to be the church more than ever, and Jesus says, don't neglect justice. Don't neglect justice. And I've, and I've had quite a bit of pushback from people that have said, Mike, I, I hear what you're saying, but you, you look at the George Floyd, for example, take that as one case, although there's many, but... I do not consider that we have a systemic or a structural problem is what I've had many people say. What you had was a bad apple. You've got one bad apple. There's bad cops. There's bad pastors. There's bad bosses. There's bad parents. But don't put everyone in that category, to which I 100% agree. But they would say that this was one example of this is just one bad apple. But it's, it's, and that was unrighteous. What that man, what that cop did to, to George Floyd was unrighteous. But stop acting like this is injustice. It was unrighteousness for him. Him to die, but it wasn't unjust as far as the system goes, to which when I'm looking at this, I, and I'm just pleading with you now, because when we're looking at this, we'd say, wait a minute, it, why has it traditionally taken a very long time for, for someone to get arrested when something like this has happened, for the, for the justice to be served? Obviously, it was, it was many, many days before the other officers that were involved um, got charged or arrested as well. But then you can say, well, look at, look at the cop that did this. He was obviously a bad apple. Well, we know that because he had multiple charges against him and multiple sort of accusations against brutality in the past. And the question is, why is it that there's a system in place where someone would be in a position to be able to do something like that? That's the structure. That's the system, and that is the injustice. That's where there's the injustice. When I'm reading in Isaiah chapter 1, where we've got this description from God, it's a mandate. He says, learn to do good. Seek justice. Correct oppression. Bring justice. And, and, I've, and again, man, guys, I want to be very gentle with this. And I want to be... But, but, but I want to be honest, and, and I want to be faithful to God because I've gotten so much pushback. I write a blog, and to be fair, most of it's been from people that read my blog. Most of it's not been from people in our church, but it's been a lot of people saying, you keep on saying that there is systemic injustice or racism, and Mike, I don't think it's there, to which I would respond to many emails now. And I've got a lot of hours in this and hours in phone calls where people would say, I do not think there's any systemic oppression taking place, to which when I'm reading Isaiah 1, and I have a mandate for from God that I'm supposed to be part of correction of oppression. How do you correct oppression that you do not think exists? I was in an email with someone and I said, well, do you think there was oppression in America 50 years ago? And they said, yeah, it was demonic. To which my question was, when do you think it disappeared and where did those demons go? Jesus says one of the weightier matters of the law is justice. It's justice. Mike, you're, you're making it hard for cops. Man, if there's anyone that's got a hard job right now, it's cops. Let me, if you are a cop right now, man, thank you. Thank you. I was talking to one of the cops in our church. Got called into one of the neighborhoods in our city. 
goes in there, drug deal, gone bad, little kid at risk, cop asked to go in there, save the day. He's all by himself, white cop, got to go into a neighborhood, predominantly black neighborhood. He walks in, everyone looks at him, despising him, takes out their phones, ready to catch him doing anything he can do wrong. He had every reason in the world to peace out, walk out of that room, walk out of that situation, get out of that setting. I'm like, well, what did you do? He's like, I, there's a need, there's justice to be served. He was a hero. So, so listen, majority of cops are heroes. I believe that. Most pastors are good guys. Most of the whoever's are good. That does not change the systems and structures. I've sp we have spoken to the, the officers and, and others, even in our own city, that have said that they've sometimes even pushed for changes that the structures, not just in Gainesville, but the structures across the board do not allow. Guys, I'm just letting you know, you cannot correct oppression that you do not think exists. And Jesus said one of the weightier matters of the law, he says, it's justice. And man, friends, when, when people get shot and I come to church, and obviously right now I'm preaching to an empty room, but when everyone's here, Something's up when, when I come to church and, and the black brothers and sisters are weeping and grieving and the white brothers and sisters don't even know what's going on. And, and I keep coming to people and asking them their stories and, and I find out about you know, guys that when they were in, in sixth grade, they got, they, they got patted down and frisked and pushed around or someone that gets stopped for a, for a taillight out and a gun gets put to their head. And, and I hear story after story after story after story after story. And at some point, you've got to say, do you, are, are they all making this up or is there systemic structural issues? Doesn't mean you're a bad guy. It means there are systems that outside of heaven, there are systems that are not right and we are to bring correction. Jesus says, don't neglect the way to your matters of law. That's justice. The second one, and if I was preaching this as a longer sermon, I'd probably call this how to be a Pharisee. Number one, here's how you become a Pharisee. You neglect justice. Number two, though, the way you become a Pharisee is you neglect mercy. He said, the way to your matters of the law, it's justice and it's mercy. Could you just even look at someone in the room that you're with right now, or maybe type it in the chat right there and just say, we need mercy. In the Old Testament, this would get translated as has said. It was, it's like the steadfast love of the Lord. Never ceases. It's mercies. His mercies never come to an end. They're new every morning. They're new every morning. This is the, the mercy. This is the, the great covenant love of God. It's, it's to be gracious and kind and loving and helpful and patient. It's, it's a word that describes the otherworldliness of God. In other words, God is saying, you need to enforce justice, but you can't handle a world of justice with no mercy. You've got to have mercy at the same. And watch, not even just as independent things, they've got to come together. Mercy and justice, they've got to come together. And yet we've arrived at a dangerous place in culture because we now live in a culture that you could really describe as a cancel culture. If, if you say something wrong, we will cancel you. If you do something wrong, we will cancel you. If we dig up something from your past, we will cancel you. And right now you'll find, uh, you know, uh, athletes that have pictures that were taken with someone that the media will say, uh-oh, that guy's homophobic. So the, the athlete that has a picture with him, he's canceled. Or the person that spoke something. And, the, and we cancel people in 24 hours or less now. You're done. I mean, people go on. They'll say, hey, Twitter, go do your thing. And all I'm telling you is this. Watch, watch, because right now we're, a lot of us are in danger right now because some people have neglected justice. Some people are neglecting mercy. And they're saying, you know what? They deserve that. No, they do deserve that. And I deserve hell. That's what I deserve. I deserve the wrath of God. But Jesus says, don't you dare neglect the weightier matter of mercy. Because if you neglect mercy, you're a Pharisee on the other side of the coin. You neglect justice, you're a Pharisee over here. You neglect mercy, you're a Pharisee over here. And Jesus says, oh, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. And right now, more than ever, we have a need for the church to repent of our modern-day Phariseeism. Right now, I see Pharisees on the right, and I see Pharisees on the left. I see patriot Pharisees. I see uh, social activists, social justice Pharisees. I'm watching Pharisees everywhere, and I'm telling you, man, I know this is a rough moment to be living in right now, and it is difficult. Trust me, as a pastor who regularly hears from people that say, me and my checkbook are piecing out on this church because of things that you say. I got white people saying that. We got black people. People saying that I, and we're in the middle of a pandemic where money is troubling and all that. It's like, what? Trust me, I'd much rather just get up right now and say, hey, y'all, everything's going to be all right. What I'm telling you is we must not neglect the weightier matters of Jesus. Justice and mercy have got to come together. And I know this is rough, but man, this is our chance right now. 
There's nowhere in the world, there's nowhere in my culture that I can see right now that someone is doing justice and mercy. Only the church can do this. <laughs> Could you imagine if we became known as the people that we, we stand for justice, that, that, that we listen? There's, what is this? How do I apply this, Mike? What it means is you listen to the oppressed in their oppression. That means you, you listen, but then we come and, and we bring a spot of mercy. We come with mercy and we look to the one. You could say, well, how, how could I do it? I can't. I'm so angry. I can't. Well, you can't. That's why Jesus has his third word, which is mercy and justice and faithfulness. It's a Greek word that's the same Greek word that often gets translated as faith, as belief, as looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. It's, it's looking unto him. It's saying, wait a minute, Mike, why do you believe what you believe about justice? Because Jesus Christ is Lord. Mike, why do you believe what you believe about mercy? Because Jesus Christ is Lord. Mike, what's your big concern right now? I'm concerned for people saying America first when Jesus said, seek first the kingdom. I'm concerned for people that are, that are their, their new faith has become social activism. I'm like, whoa, whoa, what happened to Jesus? I'll watch post after post after post, and I see no Jesus, and I hear no Jesus, and I'm just telling you, I don't have faith in anything outside of the name of Jesus because there is no other name under heaven by which men and women can be saved and delivered and justice can come then by the name of Jesus the Lord. In fact, if you're in a chat room right now, I dare you to go ahead and say, Jesus Christ is Lord. In fact, I'm going to say it again, Jesus Christ is Lord. Why do I believe in justice? Because Jesus Christ is Lord. Why am I willing to take bullets for justice? Because Jesus Christ is Lord. Why am I going to take bullets for mercy? Because Jesus Christ is Lord. Mike, what do you want me to do? I, I want you to make your confession to the whole world. Jesus Christ is Lord. I dare you the next time you post on social media, post about justice, but do it in Jesus' name. I, I want you just to go start getting educated and, and, and read books, but do it in Jesus' name. Go check out the website, JesusLovesJustice.org. Go check out the, some of the things that people are trying to do to come and, and to bring the lordship and the kingship of Jesus so that we can say, God, may it be on the earth as it is in heaven. Mike, where do I go from here? You know, there, this week we're going to be dropping a podcast interview with John and Joel. Some of our pastors, go check out the podcast this week. You're welcome to read some of the things I blogged about. But whatever you do, I want you to open this book with fresh eyes and to devote your life and your heart to the weightier matters, justice and mercy and faithfulness. I end it like this. I do not think this is naturally possible. I only think the way this ever happens is by looking at the one who did this in spades? Because Jesus Christ on the cross, he goes up, pays for my sins and yours, where he pays for injustice, and he releases the mercy of God. It's on the cross where the mercy and the justice of God come together. The faithfulness of God comes together so that we can come and become new. And when you put your faith in him, man, I'm telling you something happens. So church, I'm going to beg you, be slow to speak, quick to listen, slow to get angry, and that when we say amen today, that you go out and you commit yourself, maybe even go memorize Matthew 23, 23. And let's watch God go change our world. If you've never turned to Jesus, it could start like this. Jesus Christ is Lord. If you've been wrestling, today's the day for you to make this confession again. Jesus Christ is Lord. He's my rabbi, he's my king, he's my teacher, he's my leader, he's my all in all. Jesus Christ is Lord. If you need prayer for something, you can tell one of those that are in the chat right now. But I'm just going to close out this time right now by speaking the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ upon you. Some of you that have been struggling with uh, pains in your digestive tract, some of you that have had digestive issues, I pray in the name of Jesus for the healing of God to come upon you. Some of you that have had uh, lumps in some parts of your body and it is not left and you're wondering and there's even a fear that's there, in the name of Jesus the Lord be healed. Some of you that have got a cancer report, I'm praying even today that that cancer report is going to be reversed. I curse the cancer, I bless your body, and I speak a hope and healing over you. And some of you that have had uh, joint problems and injury problems, you've not been able to move parts of your body, in the name of Jesus, the Lord, be healed. Some of you that have had migraines, some of you that have not been able to sleep for weeks, in the name of Jesus, today, receive your peace again, receive your help again, receive your wholeness again, in Jesus' name. Amen.
South Florida, Central Florida, North Florida, God bless you. Go in peace. See you guys next week. I love you.